Good morning. Time to start. Good morning. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second conference of the year. So we are we are heading to the summer. Uh, this is done in collaboration with Band, and I know some of you were expecting Miguel, charismatic Miguel. You got me. So I'm Sato Jackson. I'm the Band Operations Director. So we have firstly. Thank you for all of you joining us today. Um, it's great to see quite a few of you here, and we have a few spaces here, and I'm sure they'll fill up in the next, next 30 minutes. Uh, we have a fantastic day in store for you. We have two world-class speakers, uh, first being Dr. Thomas Levy, Levy and the other Professor Stick Bank Mark. So for everyone at the conference band, our sponsors, our exhibitors. We would like to thank you all for attending, and I'm sure you will find this a very exciting day with our new speakers. So, for now, I have a pleasure of introducing our first speaker for today's conference, Dr. Thomas Levy, speaking on the cause of all disease, a unified theory. Dr. Levy is a board-certified cardiologist and a board-certified attorney. Dr. Levy has researched into the enormous toxicity associated with much dental work, as well as the ability of properly administered vitamin C to neutralize the toxicity. He has written 10 books addressing the wide-ranging properties of vitamin C in neutralizing all toxins and resolving most infections, as well as its vital role in the effective treatment of heart disease and cancer. So please, warm welcome to Dr. Levy. Thank you. Thank you. Let me say it's a great pleasure to come over here and be able to talk to a group like this. Uh, it's also a pleasure since I've been making a fair amount of talks around the world lately to leave the United States and still be able to speak English. So I, I hope I don't need a translator with my heavy American accent. Today, let me structure what I hope to do this morning, hope to achieve, is because both presentations are significantly connected, is that there is, I believe the evidence will show, a very solid common denominator connecting all chronic degenerative diseases, all diseases. And we'll go into that. And that the primary way to deal with this is not only with antioxidants such as vitamin C, but with identifying why oxidative stress begins in the first place. <clears throat> now let me say first before I get going, because these are two important pieces of information I think you'll want to write down that's not in any of your papers is I have three ebooks that you could download for free. Uh, they're Primal Panacea, which talks about the political and medical aspects of vitamin C. Number two, The Toxic Tooth, which will tell you really why over 90% of diseases develop, which is due to focal infections in the mouth. And number three is Death by Calcium, which if the uh, Title, if you think the title is overreaching, I assure you it's not. And you'll see in the book an enormous amount of incredible information hiding wide open. Uh, uh, the best way to bury a scientific fact is to publish it in the medical literature. <laughs> it's not until you pluck it out and put it in a book that it gets any exposure. 
So that website is my last name, Levy, L-E-V-Y, dot medfoxpub, M-E-D-F-O-X-P-U-B, dot com. You can go down there and download any of the books. Also, I'm going to talk about briefly, although it's not in the slides, the toxicity of iron and the fact that iron should never be added to foods like it has been for 70 to 80 years. If you go to youtube.com and type in my name, Thomas Levy, and then type in iron video, you will go straight to a video that, especially as nutritionists, it should severely rock your world. I'll just say that all the foods that you see that are enriched, and what do we do? We start from day one with the formulas we give our babies, has metallic iron filings in it. Metallic iron filings. And what you'll, what you'll see on that video is something I did 20 years ago. I redid it, not the video, but what was done in the video, and nothing has changed in 20 years. If anything, it's gotten worse, and there's even more metallic iron in our food than ever before. Okay? Now, this, there's a lot of references I put in, and you'll see at the end of the reference, it'll just have an author name and a number. You go to the PubMed website, type in the number, hit search, and you'll go either straight to an abstract, and sometimes the whole article. Okay, now, <clears throat> I know they say never say never, and never say always, try to cut somewhere in between. And that works 99% of the time. But I'm gonna tell you right now, and I've been working on this, massaging it, looking for exceptions to the rule, and to date have found none, and I'm gonna tell you that 100% of all diseases is caused by increased oxidative stress in the affected cells or tissues and whatever particular array that you have. And what am I talking about when I say increase oxidative stress? I'm talking about increased level of toxins, which are pro-oxidant, or decreased levels of antioxidants in a specific tissue. So basically you have more biomolecules that are oxidized than should be. That is disease, period. Now, we'll go with some definitions, and this comes under the realm, if you've heard the term, of redox medicine, okay, reduction oxidation medicine. Well, a prooxidant, which is a toxin, a toxin is a prooxidant. They're synonyms, they mean the same thing, okay? A toxin either takes away or causes to be taken away electrons from biomolecules, oxidizing them. On the other hand, an antioxidant, such as vitamin C, donates electrons and helps repair what's been oxidized. So, all disease then re results from the interaction in between and among toxins, which are prooxidant. So you hear free radical, you hear oxidative stress, those are all toxins, okay? It's really important to get clear the fact that toxins are not just some uh, exotic boogeyman. They're oxidizers. That's all toxins do to cause disease, cause illness, cause death, is to oxidize. The other one is pathogens, okay? The primary way that pathogens make you sick is the fact that they produce a lot of oxidants. They produce toxins and they increase oxidative stress wherever they are. Now, if you have some horrible infection uh, and it erodes away a blood vessel, well, yeah, you'll die of loss of blood. But if you don't do something like that, you'll die eventually of too much oxidative stress. And finally, antioxidants, and this is important because you're in nutrition. A nutrient is only a nutrient if after it's metabolized and broken down and gets down to the basic molecular level, it's only 
nutritious to the degree that it's antioxidant. So if what you eat is going to be good for you, it's because it finally produces molecules at the cellular level that have an antioxidant effect. Conversely, if it's bad for you, it's because when it gets down to the cellular level, it has a pro-oxidant or toxic effect. And on very rare occasions, you'll see something that's chemically inert that doesn't move ox uh, electrons one way or another, but that's not really of too much importance. So, <clears throat> a lot of this has come about, at least this presentation, is because I've worked with vitamin C so long, and very early on, in re doing the research and then later on treating patients or, or dealing with doctors who were treating patients, it was very bizarre to me that vitamin C, giving in large doses, was able to neutralize and or cure, use that horrible word cure, whatever toxicity or poisoning you encounter. Didn't matter what the toxin was. And there's a lot of literature on this. I'll go into that in the second presentation. But it became readily apparent that one simple molecule, this little vitamin C molecule, could cure poisoning from anything, no matter what the poison was, no matter what the chemical structure was. And although I knew it to be a fact because I continued to witness it happening day in and day out, it still made no sense until the concept of all toxicity being due to oxidation. Then it made a lot of sense. So, a prooxidant and a toxin are one and the same and they have the same effect. An antioxidant is a true antitoxin because it restores, it restores electrons. And as I said, all pathogens are bad for you because they have such overwhelmingly oxidative stress inside your body. So, Now, so then it might come to mind is how can we have such a wide variety of chronic degenerative diseases that they can all have the same common etiology? That has to do with these five factors. It has to do with how long has that oxidative stress been going on, the duration? Where is that oxidative stress primarily located? Outside of the cell, inside of the cell, a combination of the two, one organ or tissue more than another. Number three, very obviously, how severe or advanced is the oxidative stress? Is it minimal, mild, moderate, or extremely advanced? Number four, the combination of those above three factors, okay, to the degree that you could have severe intracellular oxidative stress in one organ, that turns into malignancy. You could have a lesser degree in tissues or joints, and that results in arthritis. And then finally, and I'll go into this in a little more detail in a moment, it's the nature of the prooxidant or the toxin. Certainly, toxins widely are variable in their chemical structure. Well, that determines then what tissues they go to. So, what would be then the characteristics of the toxin or the prooxidant that causes it to have such a widely variant range of properties? Well, number one, a, oops, a toxin can be fat soluble, water soluble, or some are even soluble in both. It has a molecular size. A tiny molecule is going to get very easily in different places. A large molecule is going to have limited access. Ionic charge. Something's neutral, positive, or negative. That's going to affect where it goes and where it is capable of going. The unique molecular structure. I mean, we look at molecules on a piece of paper and they just look like a bunch of letters. But in fact, they're 3D physical structures. And so, obviously, in a lock and key fashion, if the key doesn't fit, the lock won't get unlocked. Same thing with molecules. So they have to physically fit. <clears throat> then the toxin is more toxic if it's easier to oxidize and less toxic 
if it requires a unique microenvironment to, tox to uh, oxidize. Finally, it can change, it can affect more molecules if it produces oxidative chain reactions. Now, again, depending on the structure of the toxin, it might attack one enzyme more than another. Some toxins, large molecules, and you've been exposed to it for 20, 30, 40 years, they physically accumulate. And that physical accumulation keeps biomolecules from interacting with each other. Sometimes the toxin can be similar to a structural biomolecule and replace it in a uh, completely inactive form, so you no longer have that biological function taking place. And then the things that affect it are how easily is the toxin chelated, how easily does it get excreted without chelation, and how easily is it situated in the body so that you can get rid of it by sweating. So when you look at all these things together then, you can see that one toxin can have one effect and one will have another, but they still have the same common denominator as to how they cause that effect. I like to use the example, <clears throat> you can have a toxin like cyanide, okay? You inhale the cyanide, it quickly goes into the lungs. Due to its unique chemical structure, it selectively goes into the cells and selectively blocks or oxidizes enzymes of respiration that incorporate oxygen. So effectively, in a minute or two, you die of starvation because you don't incorporate oxygen. But all the cyanide did was oxidize. It didn't do anything else. It just oxidized the, those particular things that resulted in prompt death. On the other hand, you can be exposed to mercury in its less toxic forms for 20, 30, 40 years, gradually accumulated in your brain and develop multiple sclerosis. But the damage is still oxidation. Now, I'm going to tease you with some stuff here because I'm not going to be able to talk about it, but you'll be able to get more detail in my books. Books that I'm not profiting from. I'm giving them away to you, okay? There you go. Now, it's good to think about and categorize what are the promoters of chronic diseases. And I said all chronic diseases are due to increased oxidative stress. So anything that promotes increased oxidative stress promotes disease. Number one, and I mean number one, far and away number one, number two doesn't even come close, are infections. Uh, my next book coming out in about three months is called Hidden Epidemic because it's now apparent that in addition to known infections in your mouth, there are occult infections in your mouth discoverable only by sophisticated technology called 3D cone beam imaging and it's these infections that cause well over 90% of all heart attacks, most causes of breast cancer, and feeds and promotes all chronic degenerative diseases because infections cause increased oxidative stress. And even if you don't know about them, which you don't, they're still active in bringing down your health. I mean, it may seem like somebody gets a heart attack or cancer because they have bad luck. And truth be known, if you have a frank conversation with your oncologist or your cardiologist, they'll shrug their shoulders and they'll say, I'm sorry, you have bad luck. Well, you didn't have bad luck, you either had a bad dentist or poor diagnosis. Diseases do not spring up for no reason at all. You might not discover the reason, but that doesn't mean there isn't one. Okay, so infections have endotoxins, exotoxins, they have byproducts that are oxidative, and they have the dental source. We won't have much time to go into the dental except to tell you that is the main source of all disease. Okay, if you have cardiac disease or cancer and you've never had your mouth evaluated, you've missed your real chance to cure that disease. 
If there's an infected tooth and it doesn't get extracted, you're fighting a losing battle even if you have the best mainstream, complementary, alternative, integrative therapy under the planet. And even if you start to get an initial positive result, you will eventually relapse or get a new cancer or continue to progress. And the doctor will just say, well, we, we helped you as much as you can, and now the disease has taken over. The body is not designed to take care of these infections in the mouth, and it doesn't without a lot of help. So number two is known toxin exposures, heavy metal pesticides. If a farmer is working the fields and he comes to you and he's got a lot of disease and you don't find out that he's exposed to an incredibly large amount of pesticides, you're not gonna, you're not gonna do the one thing that's most important for that farmer is stop that ongoing exposure. Uh, my mentor, Dr. Hal Huggins, many years ago told me with regard to the toxins in the mouth, but really toxins from anywhere that you're being exposed to on a daily basis, most medicine, mainstream or alternative, is designed at treating, their, treating what's in front of you. Let's try to neutralize this toxin. Let's try to resolve this infection. And Dr. Huggins said, Tom, you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. And really, if you have a huge ongoing exposure of toxins that you're either unaware of or you know it and you haven't addressed it, whatever your approach to treatment is, is less than half of what you should be doing. Now, I'm going to upset you a whole lot with these next two. Toxic iron status, I already alluded to the iron filings. The uh, nutritional geniuses back in the 1940s in America, United States, saw that in starved populations, there was this huge number of iron deficient children. And they say, my God, that can never happen in the United States. We will start putting iron in the food so no child will ever get an iron deficiency anemia. And that began the systematic poisoning of the entire world. If you have a normal blood count, you should never, never, did I say never? Never supplement iron. Never. Iron is the primary source of increased oxidative stress in your body. It's the way in which your body naturally kills cells. I mean, your body has to promote growth and it has to kill cells too. So iron is one of those primary regulators. If you look in the laboratory reference range of ferritin, which is iron storage, it'll say 30 to 400 nanogram per cc. Well, 400, you're getting ready to have a heart attack. I've got news for you. 30 is still elevated. The entire reference range is out of the range of normal because the entire population of the planet has some degree of iron toxicity. So we begin this poisoning from day one, and I'm just going to say a couple more things so I have a little time, is peanut allergies didn't exist when I was a kid. We all had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Why do we have so many peanut allergies now? Why do we have so much gluten sensitivity in celiac sprue? Since iron was added to our diet involuntarily, celiac sprue since the 1940s has gone up 400%. Peanut allergies have appeared out of nowhere. Multiple food allergies have appeared out of nowhere. The report on allergies in the literature is skyrocketing. What causes a food allergy? Predominantly, a food allergy is caused when all or part of a dietary protein gets into your system undigested. And then you get the antigen antibody reaction and the whole vicious cycle gets going. What's going to cause that to happen? Leaky gut. What is leaky gut? Leaky gut is chronic inflammation of your gut. 
What causes chronic inflammation more than anything else? A pro-oxidant stress like iron. So be sure to look at that YouTube video and be ready to throw out most of what's in your, uh, what's in your pantry. Now, one more thing which supports what I'm saying too is I had a gluten sensitivity about four years ago. I just read about it, it sounded like a good idea, I'll stop gluten. <clears throat> well, for about three years I had this pain in my thumb. I had the, and I as a physician, I did everything imaginable. I took high dose steroids for, for a week or two, had no effect at all on it. I mean, I was at the end of my rope, I was resolved, I said, well, at least it's done my right hand. That, that was about the only thing I, well, I stopped gluten, a week later, after three years, my thumb stopped hurting. I said, son of a gun. <laughs> and I stuck with the gluten-free for about three months, and then I got bored. <laughs> so I went out and had a bread overdose, and that night I woke up and the thumb was hurting again. I said, okay, I got the message. <laughs> went back off gluten, about another three months, four months, got really bored again. Saw this McDonald's. <laughs> Went ahead and did it. No problem. Did it a few more times. No problem. Then I made, they made the decision I was going to go on a gluten light diet. And I've done fine for three or four years since. Okay? Now, what does gluten-free food also free of? Iron. For some reason, they realize that people that are eating gluten-free diet don't want their food messed with. So they don't put any, they don't enrich it. They ought to call it and poisoning it. Okay? So, how I put all of that together. Now, everything I've else I've told you is fact. This is my opinion. What I put together then is over the course of six months, getting the iron out of my diet, my gut healed. My inflamed gut healed. And once it healed, I got news for you. If you would eat a protein, it's no problem. Now, I'm not telling somebody who already has a gluten allergy or peanut allergy to go do this for six months and then start eating peanuts and gluten again. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there'll be a few kids that'll still drop dead of a peanut allergy, so I, I don't want that on my mind. But you give the body a chance to heal, it will heal. You take away an offending substance that's causing an ongoing inflammatory damage, and at the same time, you're ingesting a quality diet you're taking your antioxidants, for the most part, the body will heal, okay? And you can have the most antigenic protein in the world in your gut, but if your gut is not inflamed and you digest normally, it's not going to hurt you. Okay, toxic calcium status. I really hope to upset a few people here. The title, Death by Calcium, is not an exaggeration. Calcium should never, never, did I say never? Never be supplemented. Never. It's all in the book. You can see it's really not my opinion. It's just incredible information lying in plain sight. Calcium is a primary carcinogen. Okay. Are calcium and iron essential for life? Yes, they're essential for life, and when you get above a certain level, they're essential for death. I mean, the body has to juggle things. Push something in one range to have a certain effect, put it in another range to have another effect. But when we get this crazy idea that osteoporosis is a calcium deficiency disease, and we start flooding our bodies with calcium, none of which is helping 
the bones, but which is depositing your arteries, in your organs, promoting atherosclerosis, promoting cancer, it's not surprising. The one consistent thing about increased oxidative stress inside the cell, which is the common, the final common denominator of all chronic degenerative disease, is also increased calcium. So, there's a lot of interesting thing in that book. I, I, I actually, since I don't have a good memory anymore, I often reread it and get fascinated by what I discovered a few years earlier. So. <laughs> Dietary toxin exposures. This is real important too, especially in your field, your chosen field. <clears throat> Coincidentally, about iron, 90% of gluten-free foods don't have iron added to it. They put, put it in another 10%. Read your labels, number one. Number two, anything labeled organic, 90% of the time doesn't have iron added to it. So that's probably your primary benefit with organic. Why I say that too is because we all have screwed up digestion. We have screwed up digestion because we eat according to our culture. We don't eat according to physiological principles. Okay? If you eat the perfect organic diet and digest it poorly, you are subjecting your body to a substantially more toxicity than a McDonald's diet digested perfectly. Okay? Because when you do poor food, com poor food combinations, lots of fluid, milk with the meal, no digestive enzymes, a lot of food at one time, then a large amount, sometimes the majority of the food begins to rot and putrefy. I mean, you ever wonder why you can't walk into the bathroom after some people? That's putrefaction, that's not digestion, okay? And the more it putrefies, you, get, you basically get another focal infection in your gut because you get a lot of clostridium and toxins coming in on a regular basis. So digestion, obviously, an organic diet perfectly digested is the best option, but that's only seen rarely. This is finally important too, low sex hormone levels, low thyroid hormone levels. Everything I'm talking about, especially the effects of toxicity in causing oxidation in your tissues, in your cells, is strongly promoted by low levels of testosterone or estrogen and low levels of thyroid hormone. Nobody should be treated in all the other ways without having these things checked. And when I say low, I don't mean low normal, I mean below the lowest levels. Those should always be treated, always, always, always. Can you hurt somebody with, with uh, testosterone or estrogen? Sure, if you do it wrong. But you're gonna hurt them more if you don't do it and do it right. Okay, I'm gonna run through this quick, but just to show you it's out there, you can study it at more length in your notes if you wish, but I put together the fact that there's roughly eight different levels of intracellular oxidative stress, and they correlate directly with the formation of disease, pathology, and ultimately cell death. Uh, number one, none are detectable. Number two, you have a minimal oxidative stress. You have basically a normal cell. Minimal to moderate is still in the normal range, but things are taking place. Then when you get to moderate levels, chronically upregulated, you start to get into the range Moderately increased intracellular oxidative stress is always seen in every chronic degenerative disease in the tissues affected, always. When you take that moderate oxidative stress and you take in something else like increased calcium, more calcium you put in, the more oxidative stress you have inside your cells, or another toxin, many other toxins are toxic because they result in the influx of more calcium inside your cell. That's their method of, of toxicity. But once you get above a certain level of intracellular oxidative stress, you have malignant transformation. 
Usually you need extra iron because iron feeds cancer cells and iron feeds pathogens. Two more big reasons to avoid iron. You basically can't have a cancer cell without a high level of iron inside the cancer cell. And you can't have a pathogen proliferation to the point of having a significant infection if it doesn't have iron to feed on. Iron is the primary food of cancer cells and pathogens, period. Then the last six are just uh, basically talking about the fact when you get it really elevated, but not to the point of cell death, you have your most malignant cells. You have your metastatic cells, you have cells that spread rapidly, you have cells that lose the identification of the tissue from which they came. Okay. Interestingly enough, and this is not here, we also have studies that show there's specific agents out there that can pull calcium out of cells. When you start pulling calcium out of cells, it becomes less malignant and sometimes it becomes normal. Does anybody out there want to take their calcium supplement this afternoon? <laughs> I hope not. Then you have greatly elevated as when you go to programmed cell death or apoptosis. And finally, when you have a rapid elevation and increased oxidative stress and you have frank rupture of the cell. So, now, I'll go through this quickly because I'm going to cover it in a little more detail this afternoon. Why is vitamin C so good for an infection? Well, number one, it enhances the immune system in at least 19 different ways. It also has its own direct anti-pathogen properties. Uh, the pathogens have a lot of iron. It upreg upregulates the fentanyl reaction, kills the cell. Uh, vitamin C neutralizes toxins like nothing else. And this is something else. Let's say, even if for the sake of argument, and, and you'll run into this a lot if you're dealing with the docs and you say, and try some vitamin C or something like that, well, they're not going to open their arms. But every infection rapidly consumes vitamin C. And it's quite arguable that one of the primary reasons and ways in which infections kill people is because they induce acute scurvy. So at the very least, even if you're not using the rationale of treating somebody with vitamin C, because vitamin C is highly effective in directly treating the pathogen, you're treating the acute scurvy. And you're giving the body immune support. Also bear in mind, Vitamin C works well with antibiotics. So mainstream medicine has a little bit of good stuff and a lot of crap. Alternative medicine has a lot of good stuff and a little crap. But you need to find out where the crap is and get rid of that. OK? Everything has its, has its place. Antibiotics are good, and vitamin C is never contraindicated because an antibiotic is being given. All it does is augment the antibiotic. It increases antibody response. It increases natural killer cell production. It augments T and, C, T and B cell activity. OK, so now we get down to, I'm going to sort of accelerate here. But like I said, it's in your notes. And I can only do so much with so much time. Treatment principles for all chronic degenerative disease. Okay, first of all, you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. You have to identify and stop the new daily ongoing toxin exposure, whether it's from the outside or whether it's from the inside. Number two, you need to neutralize the toxins that are present in the body. Number three, you need to try to promote ways of excreting toxins in as non-toxic a fashion as possible because when you excrete toxins, you also retoxify. Toxins don't just come out without causing any damage on the way out. That's another topic. You need to resolve infections. And the further thing is you need to do things to identify those infections that are not being done now pretty much anywhere on the planet. You need to supplement optimally, and you need to address hormone imbalance. OK, so the biggies on minimizing new toxins, 
The big three, I call this the toxic nutrients, the toxic trio. Copper falls into the same category as iron. Copper, never, never, never supplement. You need to address dental toxins. Root canals are 100% infected, but all of them don't cause the same amount of damage. However, it's very clear in the literature that if you have one or more root canals in your mouth, you have a greater chance of heart attack, plain and simple. There are ways to modulate that, but that statistic stands on its own. The toxic tooth will, that you could download will give you more information on that. Gum infections. Now, root canals and gum infections, the pathogens identified in root canals and gum infections were looked at in a finished study by a researcher named Pessy. The cardiologist pulled the blood clots that caused heart attacks out of the coronary arteries and had them analyzed. Incredibly elegant study. Greater than 90% of those blood clots had 1,600% higher concentration of the dental pathogens in the blood clot than the surrounding blood. That is cause and effect. That's not link, that's not correlation, that's not association, that's cause and effect. You didn't have a sterile blood clot form and then all of a sudden magically all these dental pathogens and toxins started accumulating in the blood clot. So, I suspect 90% of the people in this room have a family member or a friend with heart disease. If they haven't had their mouth examined, you're missing the one chance to stop the evolution of that disease and even reverse it. Dental implants, toxic dental materials. Okay, I talked about digestive toxicity. Uh, there's a lot of ways to eliminate toxins. Um, prescription medicines should be a last resort, but they are effective. You have nutrient agents such as N-acetylcysteine, whey protein, liposome encapsulated, GSH, uh, alpha lipoic acid, uh, inositol hexaphosphate, IP6, all these things are good at getting toxins out. Sweating is one of the best ways to work on it. Far infrared sauna, definitely worth the investment. And they will tell you that iron can't be excreted. Okay, or practically not excreted at all. Absolutely false. You can sweat it all out. They actually have studies that show young aerobic athletes, who obviously sweat a lot, can sweat themselves down to an iron deficiency anemia by the end of their competitive season. So sweating does the trick. Just make sure you put back the essential minerals that you've lost, primarily magnesium. Okay. Eradicate infections. Uh, another big one is the tonsil. Don't have a lot of time, but just to tell you that the tonsil is a protective wimp. It takes care of minor infections, but you put something like a root canal or have a chronically infected tooth on the same side as the tonsil, the tonsil becomes chronically infected while remaining perfectly normal in appearance. And you get rid of the root canal, you get rid of the infected tooth. And this came from personal experience, incidentally. 20 years later, you can start having chest pains, as I did. And after I saw the information that I'd read about, I said, I've done everything imaginable. I need to lie to my ENT and get these tonsils out right away. Tell them I'm tired of having tonsillitis. Well, surgeons like to operate, so that wasn't a problem. <laughs> he took them out. I said, what'd you think? You can say I'm really compressing a story rapidly here. He said, well, everything was fine. He said, they looked a little enlarged, but they looked normal. They said, but when I grabbed the tonsil on the left side, pus started coming out. That was the same side I had my root canal 20 years earlier. Once infected, the tonsils never recover. And they can absolutely destroy your health. Okay. Uh, why should you correct hormone levels, leave, leave well enough alone, you got an older person, I don't want to mess with it. Well, the only reason not to give hormones to an older person is because you're clinically lazy and you don't want to take the time. 
You use the right type, you monitor carefully, you look for deterioration or improvement in blood levels, you go very, very slow, you don't target <coughs> to go more into the mid-range of normal, you don't go high, you don't want to put jet fuel in a, rock, in a Model T, okay, but uh, you go slow and you get the job done. <coughs> and this is supported by the fact that low levels of all these hormones increases all-cause mortality, meaning your chance of death from anything. That means it's affecting positively every cell in your body. <clears throat> All right. Just a little, a little myth out there. They talk about testosterone uh, replacement uh, increasing chances of prostatic cells becoming malignant. No, doesn't do that. But what it does do is help pre-existing cancer cells grow. So basically, if, you already, if a man already has some prostate cancer that's not apparent, testosterone supplementation might make that apparent, which is good, because then you find out earlier rather than later that you have prostate cancer. Thyroid hormones, this is <clears throat> quickie introduction here. Free T3 to reverse T3. Traditional thyroid testing is, and if there's an endocrinologist in the room, I apologize, but I don't care. <laughs> standard thyroid testing is crap. All standard thyroid testing does is tell you if you're mildly to severely hyperthyroid or extremely hypothyroid. It tells you nothing about the situation that the vast majority of adults are in on this planet, which is minimally hypothyroid. Tells you nothing at all about that. Zero nada. <coughs> also, the thyroid gland, basically those thyroid tests tell you the thyroid is functioning normally. It doesn't tell you the body is. We're literally Every cell in your body is a mini thyroid gland. The thyroid gland produces all the T4. The active form of thyroid is T3. So what you want is conversion of T4 to T3. Well, 20% of the conversion of T4 to T3 takes place in the thyroid gland, maybe 10%. The rest takes place inside, thank you, inside each cell of your body by enzymes called deiodinases. When these enzymes are deficient and the T4 is not being converted to T3 inside those cells, your hypothyroid, even though your thyroid gland numbers look perfectly normal. What does reflect that state is another thyroid test called reverse T3. When you have an increased state of oxidative stress in your body, which basically means any chronic degenerative disease, these enzymes become inhibited. They, rather than convert the T4 to T3, they convert the T4 to reverse T3, which is like a, uh, a, a lock with a, with, a, with a key that doesn't work, okay? We now know that you have to have certain ratios of this. So you need T3 to reverse T3 to be 18 to 19 to 1 or more. If it's 17, 16, 15, that indicates cellular hypothyroidism, even though your thyroid gland appears normal, and you need to take some degree of thyroid hormone and be monitored well. Don't take T4 because the defect is in the conversion of T4. And what's the most commonly supplemented thyroid drug? Synthroid, T4. So there's a lot of people that never get really their treatment done right. Desiccated thyroid or even T3 specifically addresses this. Now, I told you that study about root canals and gum disease directly causing most heart attacks. Well, Dr. Broda Barnes found, he treated back in the 70s, about 1,600 patients over a 20 year period with desiccated thyroid. None of 800 women had a heart attack and only four men did during that period. 
If you look at the Framingham study, that should be 75 to 80 had heart attacks, statistically speaking. Yet, we know that 40, 50, 60% of those patients statistically had root canals, had gum disease, had the whole ball of wax, but they didn't get heart attacks. So the thyroid hormone, when you completely normalize it, practically completely blocked the ability for focal infections in the mouth to take hold inside the coronary artery and cause heart disease. Very, very important. You need to have a doc who understands reverse T3 and understands these principles and is willing to follow you on that because if you go to an endocrinologist, I wouldn't be optimistic. So also, during this same period of time, Dr. Barnes didn't ask any of his patients to stop smoking or anything else. I mean, I'm not suggesting you lead a lousy, health, lousy health-wise lifestyle, but just take care of your thyroid status. But there's good evidence you can get away with it for a long time if you do. <clears throat> All right, so I talked about that and that. So I would tell you that with regard to thyroid therapy, the diminished intracellular thyroid function is arguably one of the most important yet chronically unaddressed factors in the effective treatment of heart disease and chronic degenerative disease in general. And although we don't have the direct evidence to show this, I can tell you too, that applies to the breast cancer. Okay, well over 70% of breast cancer cases are directly caused by the drainage of dental infections in the shared lymphatics going down into the breast. And if you start doing thermography on everybody with breast cancer, you'll see the hot lines going from the mouth right on down to the breasts, okay? The breasts are simply there draining these chronic tooth infections, okay? So, optimized vitamin C, I'm gonna go into that this uh, next talk. <clears throat> Finally, Supplementation, I'm not gonna go into any detail here because there are hundreds if not thousands of good supplements. Nobody can afford to buy them all, nobody can afford to ingest them all, so you gotta pick and choose. What I'm gonna tell you right now is there's a big four. There's the big four, and the reason is, I'll tell you ahead of time, is each one of these things, which is magnesium, vitamin C, vitamin K, and vitamin D. Each one of these things supplemented by themselves decreases all-cause mortality. So it has a positive effect on every cell in your body. And I'm going to tell you, when you look at death by calcium, you'll see the evidence that they all work to decrease intracellular oxidative stress and either block calcium from getting into the cell or help calcium exit from the cell. <clears throat> so number one is magnesium, and it also not only decreases intracellular calcium, it helps the osteoporotic patients, it dissolves calcium deposits. I will tell you this, I'm sort of the vitamin C guy, but the number one supplement is magnesium. Nothing can substitute for low magnesium, but other antioxidants can substitute to a limited degree for vitamin C. <coughs> So you have magnesium, vitamin C, I'll talk about that in detail, vitamin K, and vitamin D. Vitamin D needs to be adjusted by blood level, but you've got to take the time to do this because too little you'll die soon, too much you'll die soon. So you can't just blow it off and say, I don't want to be bothered with it. All right. Uh, ozone is coming into its own for dealing with a lot of these dental infections. So recap. Increased oxidative stress is the final common denominator of all chronic degenerative disease. You want to reduce the number of oxidized biomolecules to mitigate these diseases. Vitamin C, as we'll see next talk, is the foundational treatment for all of these diseases, but not by itself. And intravenous vitamin C is a highly effective and wide-ranging treatment. And there's my website. There's a lot more information there articles. Uh, you can also email me. I'm not going to give you a personal consultation, but if you're asking a question about these protocols or something that you did or didn't understand, 
you know, I can feel those questions to at least a limited degree. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Questions? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, wait, we got a microphone for you here. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for this uh, excellent presentation. It was really um, very interesting, especially hearing about uh, impact of calcium. What would be then your recommendation for patients who do have low calcium? calcium and problems with uh, osteoporosis. Okay, they only have low calcium in the blood and they've only lost that along with many other things. When you take calcium, even if the bone mineral density test goes up, the tendency to fracture does not change. So it's what is like I call putting a fresh coat of paint on a rotten fence. You, you physically make a better appearance, but you don't decrease that. These four things I talked about, magnesium, vitamin C, Vitamin K, vitamin D, they all decrease fracture incidence. They all help rebuild new bone. And quickly, yes, you have less calcium in the bones, but only as one part of the disease process. And the loss of that calcium from the bone, because the bones do carry 99% of the calcium in the body, the loss of that calcium from the bones has been depositing and feeding these calcium deposits throughout the rest of the body. So when you take the calcium supplementation, you just make that calcium deposition throughout the rest of the body worse. Now, you might see a few studies out there that suggest calcium decreases osteoporosis fracture incidence. Take a closer look at the study. And for some crazy reason, I don't know if it's intentional or stupid, but they're also giving those patients vitamin D, like they consider calcium and vitamin D a mono supplement. But when you see studies that look at calcium alone, there's no positive effect, but there's a substantial increase in death from heart attack and cancer. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's along the same lines, actually. What would you suggest when um, somebody's had a blood test and they are significantly deficient in iron? Um, you know, would you then consider supplementation? They're never deficient in iron if they have a normal blood count. If they, have, if they do not have an iron deficiency anemia, you see, probably well over 95, 98% of the iron is used in making blood. And even though it might help with hundreds of enzymes in the body, the amount of iron it takes to be cofactors in those, in, with, in those enzymes is infinitesimal. So you always know that if you have enough iron to make enough blood, you've got more than enough iron to, uh, to help the other enzymes throughout the body. So it doesn't matter how low your iron is if your blood count is normal. The lower, the better. Could I just ask, um, in uh, blood tests, which are the markers for iron? So you get iron transferrin, ferritin. Which are the markers that are the most accurate for iron status? In the ferritin. 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 The, one, the one caveat I would put on that is uh, Ferritin is also an acute phase reactant, so if you, which means it responds and goes up in cases of inflammation. So if you have somebody acutely ill with an infection or something else going on, you can see a falsely elevated ferritin. But draw your ferritins during the states of maximal clinical stability, and you'll have a reliable one measurement to another measurement, whether your iron levels are stable, going up, or going down. The best way to get very high elevated levels of ferritin down quickly is phlebotomy, blood giving. I mean, one unit of blood will usually knock your hemoglobin down by about one and a half grams and not take out a, a lot of iron. If you feel the patient is having disease problems that are acutely being exacerbated by an extremely elevated iron, maybe chest pain, ferritin of five or 600, then you would consider using the, uh, the chelation drugs to get it into a more safe elevated range and then work on it longer term with the other agents, such as IP6, such as uh, the, uh, uh, such as the far infrared sauna and things like that. 
I'm sure Dr. Levy will be well, welcome to answer more questions when the break. But we'll have a 30 minute break now and then we'll be back at 11.30 for the second part of Dr. Levy's presentation. So thank you very much. All right. All right. Thank you.